Thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar. Our topic is navigating the contents for personal property portion of your insurance claim. Tonight's webinar will be translated into Spanish. So please choose your language here, English or Spanish. So a little bit about United Policyholders. We're a nonprofit that's been providing insurance consumers information and education about insurance issues and disaster recovery since uh, 1991. We're not for profit, not for sale, and we're funded by donations and grants. We do not accept money from insurance companies. Our team up is a professional team government nonprofit partners and volunteers who help provide the content that we're going to be discussing today in other topics. We have three programs. Roadmap to Recovery, which is this program where we provide guidance on insurance um, and getting back home after a catastrophic loss. Our Roadmap to Preparedness, which takes those lessons we learn uh, from working with people post-disaster and helping households reduce risk and be more resilient in the face of disasters in the future in our advocacy and action program that uh, takes those uh, the, the pitfalls and information that we've learned uh, through the, these programs to help enforce and improve consumers' rights and protections. Um, this is our little yellow book, the Disaster Recovery Handbook and House Inventory Guide. Please email this address to have a book mailed to you if you do not already have it. It's a great complement to the recovery process. We'd like to get it in your hands. We'd like to thank our funders for Oregon and Washington and the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. Um, and on our website, we have a disaster library sp specifically built for each of your states. So for Washington, this is your library. Again. For Oregon, this is your library. Again. And you can access all of these by going on our website to the recovery help and then selecting your disaster. So fine print, this workshop is intended to be general guidance only. We do not provide legal advice. If you have a specific legal question, we recommend that you consult an experienced policyholder attorney. We do have professionals uh, listed on our help website, on our uphelp.org website, but we do not warrant or endorse any of those. And to get us started, insurance is a vehicle to get you back where you were before your loss, but it will not drive itself. So you have to be proactive to restore your assets and collect the insurance proceeds to assert your rights and ask for what you need. Uh, we recommend you put your request in writing and there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Help is available. Guiding principles. You're gonna focus on documenting the full extent and value of your losses. Um, Give your adjuster the chance to do the right thing, but don't be a pushover. Um, leverage and negotiation are key. We always recommend that you adopt this demeanor, fly to serve, and stick at the help that you need. Uh, just to be aware, your adjuster is going to likely submit whatever inventory or spreadsheet you provide to a separate in house contents department or an outside service. Um, so, just when you're doing this, be sure that they are working with what you provided. Um, and that information comes back there. Uh, one of the things to be aware of is, you know, your insurance claim is a business transaction. This is a legal contract that you've signed with them. And so there's this tension naturally between you and the insurance company. Obviously they wanna minimize the amount they're paying out on your claim. And you, the policyholder, wants them to maximize the amount they're paying for you. Um, and being aware that adjusters, they vary in experience and personality. If you're having issues with an adjuster, document those issues in writing and request a change if you need. And our basic premise behind this workshop and others is that knowledge equals power. And the more you understand about your insurance benefits, your rights in your state, and the value of your losses, the more benefits you're going to recover to rebuild your home and your life and the smoother your cutting. It does take time though. So today's topics, 
We're going to be talking about knowing your limits for personal property, options for completing your claim, how to document and value your personal property. We're going to dive into the lean though here, I'll talk about why depreciation matters and how to protect yourself with your personal property. So the first part is knowing your policy. You should have received a complete, a full copy of your policy. It will be uh, dozens of pages long. If you've got something that's somewhere between three and 10 to 12 pages long, it might just be a declarations page or renewal document. And you want that complete policy so that you've got all the language that outlines things such as this, your sublimits, exclusions, riders and schedules, and your rights and responsibilities the duties you have to complete your plan. Uh, once you have that policy, uh, we recommend in, when you organize and document, you, you want to have a copy of it that you mark up um, so that you can track what you know about your policy. You want to save and scan all receipts as you purchase replacement items. Um, and you want to keep a record and a timeline of all your communications. One of the other things in this about knowing your policy is networking with others who have the same insurance company to see who's had success in negotiating less stringent requirements. So contents claims tip to your goal, obviously is to collect the full amount your insurer owes you for every item that was damaged or destroyed by either at least the options you have to accomplish that goal, negotiating a waiver of the inventory requirement or negotiating a reduction in the paperwork burden to you get your payout, preparing a detailed list, an inventory that describes and values everything you lost, and then submitting that to your insurance company, along with receipts as you replace items or hiring professional help. So knowing your policy limits, uh, your personal property or your contents are typically included under coverage C. If you have State Farm, it's going to be under coverage B. And coverage C is basically your belongings, what you would take with you if you lived, or if you would turn the house upside down and shake it, what would fall out? So think California closets built in versus alpha shelving. The alpha shelving you can install, uninstall, take it with you, California closets is built in. And you will find your contents limits on your declaration page. You wanna check the dollar amount, the limits for your coverage. It's usually a percentage of your dwelling limits. Um, in this example, it's a, it's a dollar amount. Um, you're also going to check for sublimits and scheduled items. And those would be things that would increase or decrease the value of your claim for your personal property. Um, so you're going to do the math. Like I said, it's usually a percentage, uh, 75%. Um, if you have a secondary home, you want to confirm in your policy um, if it, there's a difference, because if it's a primary home in some states, the, the contents coverage is different than a secondary home. Uh, if you have a secondary home, it's typically 50%, uh, but you wanna see what the carrier has determined your dwelling limit to be. You wanna check for these scheduled items that have added and assured value, such as artwork, jewelry, valuables. Uh, you're gonna check for sublimits, cash, stamps, firearms, jewelry, watches to see what is, what is covered. And then you want to check those sublimits based on the type of payroll. And we'll talk about an example of why that matters a little bit later. Big thing here, what is required in your policy versus what is the request from your insurer or your adjuster? And this is why it's so important to know your policy. You want to locate that policy language that states what your duties and responsibilities are in documenting your loss. Compare this with what the adjuster is asking you to provide. Um, if you do not find that it's in your policy and don't believe it will assist your claim to provide this extra requested information, ask your adjuster to show you where this requirement is in your policy. And if you have any questions, check with your state's Department of Insurance to understand the laws and guidance that apply to your claim. Now, because you have your duties and responsibilities, you do need to provide everything you can manage to help you receive the full amount you are owed under the policy. And so here's an example of your policy limits. Um, so, you know, personal property circle here, coverage C. Um, and there's a, the call out for the coverage includes the personal property replacement costs. Here's another example. 
Um, and so this red circle here, um, you can see coverage C again. That's included in the policy here. And here's an example from a mobile home. So again, it's, with the exception of State Farm, it is typically called coverage C. Um, and here's the example of the State Farm policy. So it's coverage B. Um, and you can see the, the close up here that shows you what that looks like. And most standard examples have coverages listed like these two. So speaking about personal property, here's an example of those special sublimits. Uh, these are typically in your policy in the state, the total amount the insurer will pay for each category listed. Um, now, if you've paid for a rider or schedule in your policy, you may have additional coverage outside of these close-up limits. Uh, but that again is something else you're gonna be looking at. Bear in mind, these sublimits are within the bounds of your coverage C. These are not additional coverages. Um, and so looking at these typically um, some common limits, uh, we're gonna uh, cover these again, but uh, it'll be written for you later. Uh, money can be up to $500. Business property is usually limited somewhere between 500 to 2,500. Computers, electronic equipment might be up to 5,000. Um, other items in this circle here is an example by Peril, as I mentioned earlier. They, uh, other items like jewelry, firearms may have special limits that might apply to a specific type of peril. In this example, it's theft, but this might this peril doesn't apply to fire. So you're going to look for language like by theft of, um, and which is a is a sublimit that's related to that type of peril. Okay, items that are not usually covered. These are known as exclusions. If they are insured elsewhere, as I mentioned earlier, they may be referred to as scheduled. So these are the types of items that are typically not insured. So jewelry, art with its own coverage, your pets, property of any uh, subtenants or roommates. Motor vehicles are not usually covered. Certain policies will provide coverage for ATVs and snowmobiles. Uh, farmers policies uh, might include motor vehicles, uh, such as recreational vehicles that are only used on the resident premises. So just being aware of what your policy language here is key. And this is a survey that we, uh, we run after disasters that show you what the responses are from previous disaster survivors. And this makes the point earlier about we talked about the options you have. You can ask uh, for a waiver, right? And so um, here in this example, um, they paid 100%, 24.55% uh, of the respondents were paid 100% of the policy limits without the requirement of an inventory. Um, sometimes they'll allow you to provide less paperwork when we talked about reducing that paperwork burden, allowing you to bulk list items. Um, this example here is where they offered less than full policy benefits in exchange for not requiring it. Uh, but depending on your policy language, this is a duty and a requirement, and so typically you're expected to do it. But we wanted to show you this information so that you know that there is, uh, there, it's worth the ask to see if you can get it and that, to make, make that negotiation. Um, and so, as, we, as I just mentioned, so these are the options to consider to complete your claim. It's asking for that full partial policy limits payout and a waiver for all or part of the inventory itemization requirement. Uh, please look at your state's Department of Insurance bulletins and notices to see if they've made a request. Um, a lot of states um, now with the, with the wildfires we saw last year um, are requiring a, are requesting that insurers provide at least a uh, in advance and before you submit inventory. So it's, it's worth looking at that to see. And if you're significantly underinsured, it is definitely worth asking for that 100% waiver. Uh, the waiver is good to get money in your pocket. Um, just to be aware, if, you're, if your state does have a, a, a waiver to provide you a, an advance, 30% or something like that, to get funds beyond that, you're gonna to have to continue documenting and submitting that process. 
The second option, of course, is preparing that detailed inventory uh, where you uh, submit your list to your insurance company and then later you're spending receipts as you replace items or hiring professional help to do this for you. Um, and just be aware. So it, it's important to know that your insurer might provide a template, but unless it states in your policy that you're required to use their template, um, you can provide it in a different format. Um, oftentimes they're also gonna information that's at, request information that may not be required. Um, and so be aware of that. Prepare, you prepare your inventory um, and make sure that it reflects what you know about what you have. So when you complete your inventory spreadsheet, um, if your list exceeds your coverage C limit or coverage B if you would State Farm, request the claim be paid in full without the need to replace or submit receipts. Don't look at biting off uh, preparing that inventory and doing all of that documentation um, as you're replacing items if you're able to um, justify that. So take a deep breath here for a second, uh, just to give everybody a chance to catch up. It's a lot to digest, you know, so we're gonna give you, uh, not overwhelm you with this. So take a breath and then we'll keep moving on. So next topic is documenting and valuing your personal property. So if your insurer insists on a detailed inventory, you're going to gather the available receipts, your photos, what records you have, get help from your adjuster assigned to your claim to help build a complete and accurate list of everything to stand your story. Um, if you have State Farm, you can request they provide you assistance, and they should assign someone to help you with this. If you're with State Farm and you have an outside adjuster, not someone within State Farm that's going to be contracted with, you might need to go up the chain of command until you reach someone within State Farm. Bear in mind that when you build that inventory, you can submit it to them, and then they're going to give this back to you. Um, and so you want to trust but verify their valuations of your possessions. Uh, you want to make corrections on that list if needed, and we'll walk you through how to do that in a few minutes. And then you're going to focus when we talk a little bit more about depreciation, just be aware that that is an area that you want to um, fight back on because it is critically important that you uh, apply depreciation fairly. Um, so we believe it's best for you to prepare and submit an accurate inventory yourself. We have free tools to help you with that. Um, they're going to be on this next slide here. Uh, this is the, the place on our website to find them, www.uphelp.org slash contents. And so these are examples of the different publications we have that you can download, uh, different tips. We have multiple spreadsheets that will help you that you can use. Just bear in mind that whatever you plug in that spreadsheet needs to be modified to reflect what you had. Uh, don't, you don't want to submit something that's not your own. And so talking about building that inventory, um, it's, you're gonna start with this list, right? And, and it's whatever works for you. You can do it by room, by topic, by category, whatever works for you to fill it in. It needs to work with the way you think because it's, it's a lot to do and we know that. And so as, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, spread, a spreadsheet, a sample spreadsheet on our website that you can use. There are lists in the yellow book that can help you remember um, and we highly recommend that you use family and friends to help you with your inventory. Um, they might have pictures that they're willing to share. They might be willing to list a room for, for you. They might be willing to, from their memory, uh, write, you know, get you started. Uh, one of the tools that we found is very helpful is going to stores with a gift registry to scan and list uh, to value items you've had, use the internet to build your, build your list. Um, and then one of the things in building this list is celebrate every success, no matter how long, how small, because this is a massive task and, and you need to break it into bite-sized pieces so that you're not overwhelmed. Step two, adding to your list. Uh, keep that running list with you. You're never gonna know when you're gonna remember something to add to it. Um, keep a pen and paper with you, make a note on your smartphone, whatever it takes to make this work for you. One of the tools uh, people use in adding to their list that's been very helpful is checking with your bank or your credit card companies for records of previous purchases. Some stores keep records for several years, Amazon, Costco, 
Home Depot and ask them, they can provide you that list. But just bear in mind that that is what it costs you to buy it at the time, but it gives you an idea of the things that you would have had. Uh, visualization is a great trip, trick, sorry. Uh, you wanna visualize that room you're working on, walk around in your mind, open doors, cabinets, and looking inside. And if you're somebody who needs to visualize with your eyes closed, you can speak out loud to record what you're seeing or have someone else taking notes. Estimating quantities is complicated uh, because you don't have it in front of you to guess. So um, tricks for this, uh, books and CDs generally in stacks or on shelves. Uh, you can make rough estimates with your hands, ask a friend to measure if it's something similar, go into a store and measure. Uh, so for books, you know, if you're walking into a store, you can do, uh, you know, a, a, a foot of uh, paperbacks, roughly how many books are in that, the same with hardbacks, the same with CDs, um, and then, you know, doing that calculation of I had six feet of uh, shelving, you know, uh, uh, four shelves on a, excuse me, six shelves on a, uh, on a one foot wide, and make that calculation of how many books you would have had on that. Do the same for clothing. Uh, you can ask a friend to do the measurement for you. The big thing is arranging them as you normally would and counting the number per foot. Uh, the same with closets, cabinets, drawers, figuring out a way to um, estimate how much of what would have been in there, be it pots, pans, Tupperware, towels, just thinking about the general dimensions of what you had and then looking at something that gives you that equivalent. Pricing. The emphasis here is on the cost to replace the item new. Um, so do not use sale off market and discount pricing. By the time you replace that item, that sale is going to be long gone. Stay away from eBay for antiques and collectibles. Uh, try pricing from antique shops. You can ask for their catalogs after you explain why you need it. Um, again, you know, contacting those credit card companies uh, for the newer items that might be useful. For the older items and those older statements, remember that, again, that, that you're looking for the cost to replace, not what it was purchased at. Uh, using those gift registries online, the same that you would do to build your list, to price items, to replace the items on your list. Um, so uh, working together with other survivors, uh, in 2007, we had pricing parties. Uh, we would divide it up with multiple people, multiple uh, wildfire survivors, and they would. Somebody would take the spices, somebody would do the Tupperware, and then everybody would share that and customize it to what they had. Um, and dividing and conquer again, going back to accepting offers for help. Um, you know, in, in when you're asking someone to help with pricing, ask them to create that backup documentation for that replacement cost. PDF that page so that you've got it electronically. Be aware that items of artwork that you created yourself are only valued at the cost of materials you use. And one thing to be aware, of, you know, it, it should reflect the places that you would shop. So if you've got the same item found at three different stores at three different prices, uh, you've got your proof of where you would have shopped from your credit card companies and banks for cutting those copies of the old statements. Um, but you and the insurer would agree on what is a reasonable price, not necessarily the lowest. Resources for pricing, this list could go on and on, but replacementslimited.com uh, is a company in North Carolina that has a catalog online where you, where you can match uh, when you're looking at uh, odds and ends of China, silverware, different things of um, uh, diningware especially. Uh, that's a great resource for you to figure out what this would be. Amazon, as we all know, has almost everything. Um, so, uh, and, and do, you know, again, spending time online to find those resources that you can. So to get you started, uh, we've, uh, we have an intern put us together a spreadsheet with active links to prices and descriptions for common items from multiple stores in the following spaces, your kitchen consumables, the spices I keep mentioning are on there, uh, bathroom items, kitchen items, bedroom items, home office items, these are things that you can replicate, you know, those bedroom items. If you had uh, four bedrooms, it gives you this, it gets you started and it gives you something that you can replicate. And, excuse me, let me go back here. Uh, sorry about that. Um, you can uh, go reference that uh, and tailor it to the types of stores you would have shopped. 
So pricing valuable collections, the emphasis again is on the cost to replace new. Uh, these are the characteristics of value that uh, the IRS is looking at in this thing. And um, you know, the resource for that type of pricing like outside of uh, you know, uh, shops that are specialties on this would be IRS qualified appraisers. So if you have photos and information that substantiate what you've had, uh, that you, you borrowed from, from family and friends, being able to provide that. I had a gentleman in 07 who um, had a calligraphy collection from China that was worth a tremendous amount of money. And because in the family, there were photos of that, he was able to get an appraiser to substantiate the loss of what he had. Again, another deep breath, it's a lot. And, uh, Maybe a second before we go on. So learning the lingo. So there's three terms that you need to know. Replacement cost value, or known, also known as RCV, actual cost value, ACV, and depreciation, which is also sometimes known as the holdback. And actually, I'm gonna go back to the previous uh, section just for a minute to reiterate a few important points. Uh, you wanna share what you know on your inventory uh, when you're talking about that documentation. Um, you know, be clear to summarize in a letter, an email, and you send in that inventory to your carrier what you, what you know you have. I, I provided the information I'm providing is from reconstructed bank and credit card records. I don't have receipts. I have some photos from family and friends to, uh, to substantiate what we have, but this is what I know to the best of my knowledge. Where you shop typically matters. Again, just to reiterate that. Um, and the details are critical. Just be aware, you know, 55 inch TV versus 55 inch Samsung TV, QN55Q80T model are gonna be priced very differently. And so making sure that your, your description is detailed enough to point out what you have. And that matters when we're looking at these, these um, topics as well. So let's jump on replacement costs. Um, so this is the, the price it would actually cost to repair or replace the item that right now with a new item. Most homeowners policies are replacement costs, but not all are. So you need to check and see what type of policy you have. So your actual cash value, the pre-loss value of an item. Um, ACV is important for you whether or not you have an ACV policy or an RCV policy. Um, now, if you had an ACV only policy, it's difficult to fully recover on total loss because you're only gonna get that depreciated value of these possessions, okay? So just, just be aware of that. Uh, mobile home policies are uh, one of the policies that typically does this. Um, and, and your policy may define it separately. And so there's a formula here that defines uh, that what the actual cash value typically is. So ACV equals RCV minus depreciation. Um, and so the example for this, let's go to that 55 inch TV. If the RCV value here was $600 and pretend the TV was four years old and it was depreciated 20% every year you had it, you're only gonna receive a payment of $480, right? For your ACV. To collect that remaining 120, um, you, would, um, you would have to have replaced it. And that's, that's the difference in this. So note the bolded terms in the policy here. Um, so ACV is paid first, and then replacement cost is paid when the repairs are completed in most policies. If it's not defined in your term, it's otherwise it, it will be the most common meaning for the terms in the policy. And so here's the, the points where they discuss that in this example. 
So depreciation, our third term, it's the loss in value of an item due to age and condition depending on the state. Uh, carriers typically utilize an internal depreciation guide. Um, they, we find um, that they often apply depreciation at a, a fairly high rate. Um, so you want to be very clear what the quality, the care of an item, the condition of the item is and determine what that fair depreciation is. Other terms you might see are hold back, withheld, recoverable depreciation, non-recoverable depreciation. Um, and important to note that carriers often contract out the valuation. So again, when you submit your list, verify that their pricing reflects what you have submitted. And be aware, not all positions are to be depreciated. Food, alcohol, jewelry, art, sterling silver, memorabilia are examples of things that would not be depreciated. Um, and speaking of the contracting out of the, the inventory, here's an example of a third party depreciation, excuse me, a third party uh, valuation of an inventory. So the list was submitted by the survivor um, and they, their spreadsheet, they plug everything in. Um, and you can see here on the example where there were corrections in the price. So if you look at the, sorry, oh, here. So if you look at the, the Barbie here on this first section, uh, it was a collectible Stacy Barbie. Uh, the valuation that the homeowner had for that was $65. Uh, what they were given back um, in this documentation was 29.74, so it was, it was under half of what it should have been worth. And so that's why it's important for you to look at this. The other part to look at is the depreciation. So that uh, table SIFL lamp that's um, up here, uh, it's, uh, the pricing is very close, but it's an, it's an antique and it's depreciated 50% and it should not have been depreciated. So again, when you get this list back, you wanna make sure that you go through and make corrections and that you've verified that that information is correct. And the thing to bear in mind is depreciation is negotiable. It's not a science, there is no formula. Um, and so there are many factors to consider. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, there are items that should not be depreciated. Um, if they are if on your list, if they are depreciated, challenge them. So you want to, you know, you, you want to ask them how they calculate depreciation, uh, because the the value of the item and depreciation affect your pocket, your pocketbook, uh, the payout that they give you if they excessively depreciate and they they put a lower number on the value of that item that you provided, it's going to cost you money. And so the the example we have from uh, from a Colorado survivor on this is that the uh, the Crystal Steuben collectible bowl uh, is not the same value as a Pyrex glass bowl from Walmart. But the contractor who, uh, who provided their, uh, their inventory plugged that in and then they depreciated it very excessively. So what that ended up looking like is that Kristen Steuben bowl that should not have been depreciated as an antique. The replacement value from an online auction site was $1,200. That Pirates Bowl that they had plugged in was $10 and it was depreciated 80%. So they were paid $2 instead of $1,200 for that one item. And so again, it's your pocketbook. So you wanna be making sure that you're checking this information. And this is a, a graphic example of that formula we showed you earlier, right? So replacement cost is the cost to buy that new couch. Um, this is uh, your ACV is that value of the couch an instant before the fire, what you're owed until you repair or replace it. And the deduction is what they have subtracted from that uh, to, to make you whole. You don't capture the, de the depreciation until you replace that item. And so we're going to go through some common questions here about the contents claim. So you have a, I have a replacement pol cost policy. Why are they only paying the ACB? 
And so this is the, the, that formula again. So they may hold back uh, an amount of the money from you because of depreciation. Most policies have that loss settlement provision that states you are owed ACV until the property is repaired or replaced. Um, and to, to collect that full amount you're owed, you're going to actually have to replace those items and submit that unless you're able to get a waiver. Um, and, and being aware. So the facts and circumstances of each loss differ, different limits apply. Um, as we mentioned earlier, if you're underinsured, um, you may be able to receive all the benefits available on, that, on your policy without the need to submit receipts. So if your personal property limit is 300,000, but your loss is 450, even with excuse me, depreciation applied, you may be able to support a full payout by submitting the inventory and not having to submit the receipts. And, and again, you know, uh, categorizing your possessions to um, allows you some freedom to replace possessions and receive holdback funds. So lumping things into furniture versus listing every little piece of furniture, working that out with your carrier, because you would have to get them to agree to that categorization. So here's an example of a, the loss settlement for a state farm policy. And these are the call outs for that that are important to know. You want to read your policy to see how it handles antiques and collectibles. Um, bearing in mind, um, on this example here, um, uh, you know, it says uh, it, they are only going to uh, pay the ACV until you replace the items. You know, you've got um, what they're going to do at the, this policy says two years after date of loss, they're only going to Pay the cost of repair or replace less depreciation. Uh, it could be one, it says they will pay market value. This is where they call out that antiques are not subject to depreciation. And this, this is the type of language you're going to be looking for in your policy. And this is just revisiting that state farm deck page from earlier. For a renter's policy, if the loss settlement states ACV, you're going to look to see if you've got an endorsement that allows you replacement costs. So in the language here, it goes here. They have an optional coverage to add uh, to make it replacement costs. And so they have that endorsement that protects them. So in Oregon, you have um, the, um, the time limit to replace your contents. Uh, the insurance commissioner in your state had uh, negotiated a rebuild agreement with 45 insurance companies in the state, and they're providing you two years to replace contents after loss. That is available here on um, this link here, and this is what the form looks like. And then this is just a little bit of information about the Oregon Fair Claim Settlement Practices Regulations. This is that information. This is important that, you, again, you know your rights. And so you have that information there. A little more about depreciation. Why does it matter? So coming up with that cash to replace items can be very hard, especially if they've depreciated heavily your personal property. Because I remember the, the process is that you're submitting your inventory, you get the ACV payment where they've done the depreciation. Um, and then when you replace items that they're, they're paying you that value. So you know, things to bear in mind because you don't have your proof of what you have because you don't have those items in hand. If you're uncertain about an item's age, Put the condition and be very detailed and specific about it. If something is in light new condition or um, very good, be very clear what that looks like, okay? Because you want to you provide as much factual information as you have with the information you have. So here's an example of getting to the process of getting to the agreed upon contents estimate. The top is the is the inventory example of what you would submit. The bottom is the agreed upon scope and inventory from this example is Liberty Mutual. 
And this is where they've taken the items here, plugged them in, and, um, and you're able to see what is, uh, what, is uh, what, they're, what they put in that value um, and what they're gonna pay you that initially, initially is that actual cash value. To capture that depreciation and get the replacement cost, you would be submitting those receipts if they're required. And here's another example of how the payout works. All right, so here's your itemized, uh, what you've agreed upon with them. ACV has been paid, so how do you collect the balance due? So if your replacement cost for that bath towel is 1808, they've paid you the 723, you've got 1085 ready to be uh, paid to you. And so how do you do that? You're going to submit that reimbursement requests and then show you what you've got. And that's the amount recoverable here. You wanna be strategic. Um, you know, if, if when you're going through your list and replacing items, replacing those higher ticket items is going to bring you closer to your policy limits. And remember the amount you owed is the lesser of either the original cost to buy it or the agreed upon replacement cost amount. Going back to what I mentioned earlier, age is not everything. There are other factors that impact depreciation and should be considered. So the quality of the item, the condition, the frequency of use, the care given to the item, and that remaining useful life. And this will help you minimize depreciation. And again, if you're unsure of an item's age, uh, describe the condition, excellent, like me. Um, and that would reflect these the criteria here. And remember, only you know the condition of the items that were destroyed. So you want to be as, as, as accurate as you can to the best of your ability and provide, again, whatever documentation you can to support that. And this is just a, a note explaining uh, remaining life expectancy. So here's the example of the couch. Um, if you're, you have an old leather couch, rarely used, well cared for, um, if, if, the, if, it's, if you're sure depreciates it excessively and says, well, because it's old, it's 80% depreciated. Um, but in your, according to you, in your case, since it's rarely used, it's like you, know, you took very good care of it. So you should be able to argue little depreciation should be taken. And here's an example of what that aging condition would look like. So five-year-old couch, right? If you have kids and pets and dogs and cats uh, mauling your furniture, it might need to be depreciated 80%. But if it was in excellent condition, maybe it only needs to be depreciated to 20%. And if you're in the state of Washington, uh, depreciation, uh, you have this uh, information about a court case here uh, that's helpful because it, it if the district court reason the policy's definition of actual cash value was clear and depreciation should be determined by physical deterioration and obsoleteness, that remaining life expectancy, but not age. Um, and so again, talking to your department of insurance to see what you've got. Uh, be aware of excessive depreciation. You want to negotiate depreciation and those holdbacks on a case-by-case -case basis to reflect the items. If everything on your list that you've submitted is depreciated 50%, there's something wrong because not every item on that list would have been bought at the exact same time and be in the exact same condition. So it needs to reflect the reality of what you have. And you, you do that when you submit your list and then you're correcting your list to make sure it works. There's a great uh, resource here on the claims.com page. They have a depreciation calculator that you can use to calculate what, how old something is, what type of item it was, and, um, and figure that, figure out how it should be depreciated uh, because you can, you can get into that. They also have uh, depreciation amounts. They have the guide, a guide you can download, and this is how to access it. And then on our website under uphelp.org samples, we have some, uh, some information that can help you with that as well. And bearing in mind, as I mentioned earlier, if your insurer applies a fixed percentage across all, all items, either push back or you can negotiate a more favorable fixed percentage. 
All right, we're getting on the home stretch here. One more deep breath. So protecting yourself, always, always. Never intentionally claim items you did not have. You don't need to pad your claim to get a fair settlement. If you feel your adjuster is lowballing, don't go high. You want to put what you had, okay? Because if you do, you know, if they believe you're padding or inflating your claim, uh, you're going to have lots of delays and obstacles in this process. Remember, insurance fraud, and that is intentional misrepresentation, is a felony. You can jeopardize your entire claim, subject you to severe legal penalties. Having said that, Innocent mistakes are very common. They do not amount to insurance fraud. Again, you know, like I mentioned earlier with that cover letter that you're gonna submit with your list, your inventory, be very clear about what you know. I had this information to build this. This is to the best of my recollection um, and, and, and lay out what proofs you had to be able to document that and be, be very clear. You know, my, my documentation was lost in the fire. I can only provide what I have, and this is to the best of my ability. Be organized. You want to save all receipts uh, that you, when you're making purchases. Uh, we recommend that you scan or photocopy them and email them so you have a copy for your records. You want to document all your insurance contents, claims, communication. If possible, open a separate bank account so that you're able to track exactly what you've been paid on ACB and when you get your RCD so that you can track where you are in your policy. And speaking of tracking, uh, one of our 2018 Wolsey Fire survivors, this is CPA, and put together this publication here on our website that uh, please download. It helps you keep track of where you're being paid on your buckets. And by buckets, I mean your different parts of your, your policy. And be strategic. You, you know, you're, you're not going to replace everything you lost, most likely. And it's a hassle to keep doing this. You want to maximize those ACV payments by arguing for lower depreciation, especially on your big ticket items, and identifying that true replacement cost, not the sales, not a discount, what it costs to buy it if you just walked into the store. Um, and, and take your time with this. Some people work on these for over a year, and that's okay. Uh, as long as your, your policy language allows you to, the time to do that, take the time that you're allowed to work on it because your claim's got a lot of moving parts and you want to prioritize what you're working on so that you can take care of the things you need to. Rebuilding, replacing your home takes much longer than necessarily working on this claim. This claim, that your contents claim takes a lot of mental energy, but you want to get everything moving, all these pieces in sequence so that Everything wraps up well. And always we recommend being politely assertive. Your insurance company cash your, uh, cash your premium payments in return for promising these three things. Um, and your contract with your insurer entitles you to all three of these things. Your rights under the contract are protected in the laws of your state. And so you want to be, you know, be polite, request what you need, put it in writing, keep good notes. Um, and, 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 and track what's going on. And speaking of the communication, best practices, always get it in writing. If they're not communicating with you in writing, put it back in writing to them. Send them an email, send them a letter saying, uh, per our phone conversation, whatever date, um, I understand these three things. You know, if you, if you understand differently, please respond in writing and, 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 and give me your information. And be mindful of what you say. It can be misinterpreted, okay? You want to keep it professional. You want to be concise and to the point. You know, uh, don't spend three pages detailing out your request. Use those bullets. Um, be very clear what you want to have happen. Um, you know, promptly respond to letters and reasonable requests. And avoid venting your frustrations and emotions on your adjuster. Uh, the reality is they're, they're there to do a job. They may not have the ability to make the changes that you want or in accommodations. And so you want to keep your relationship with them on an even keel. Save that venting of frustrations for your, your, your friend or family member that's willing to, to be that 
uh, that safe space for you to vent because you want to keep this person working with you in partnership to, to settle your claim. And finally, do what's best for you and your family. No one but you can access your tolerance for this process. Um, you know, people's response to this varies greatly. Uh, many, of, many of the people we've worked with have described this process as the most emotionally draining aspect of the insurance recovery process because you're having to reimagine everything you had that you lost and then figure out how to replace it and what it costs. And, and there's just a lot of moving parts to it. And a lot of people found it easier, again, as we mentioned earlier, having friends and family assist in the preparation or working with other fire survivors. Um, some people feel the need to recover every dollar to be made whole. Others may settle for less knowing they're leaving money on the table. You really do have to choose the best, best path for you and your family. Uh, Tubbs Fire Survivor, one of our team up volunteers, shared her strategy for completing her inventory. She said every page she submitted was a paycheck. And so she said if viewing it in those terms allowed her to decouple her emotions from the process. Um, and then she, you know, she joked later that it was the most she had earned per hour since she retired each page. And so, and, and, and that gets to another one, you know, breaking it into those bite-sized pieces. Victory might be completing a page in a day. I don't expect that you're gonna knock this out in a weekend. Um, having done a workshop with people where we spent all weekend working on it, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't work that way. It's it's a lot of work, and keep your expectations for yourself reasonable. Uh, just pointer here is the Oregon State Insurance Commission information on how to access resources from them. Washington State Insurance Commission. This is how you can get help with a complaint. Speak to someone. Uh, resources online for you. Again, we'd like to thank the Center for Disaster Philanthropy for allowing us to be here to serve you today. We'd like to welcome you to join us on our Survivor Survivor Forum. It's on the first and third Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, it's a great way to connect with other people. Uh, we, we bring in volunteers, our, our team up volunteers who are previous disaster, catastrophic loss uh, disaster survivors. Um, they talk about various topics, but they also answer your questions and provide that, that emotional support and that safe place to get your questions answered. Uh, upcoming events. This is uh, please take advantage of these um, workshops as we have them. And um, you click, this is on our website. You go to events here and it'll list upcoming events. And you can also see recordings of past events and related resources there as well. And for more information, if you still have questions, please do visit uh, the wealth of resources available on our website at www.uphelp.com. Thank you for your time today. Good luck with your process. We're rooting for you. Um, please, uh, please take advantage of these resources available on our website. And um, we look forward to um, connecting with you in the future. If you have any questions, please take advantage of these uh, Q&A events we have and also sending uh, emails to our info at mphelp.org. Thank you and good night.